Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Harvey Smith, and I'm the co-creative director of Dishonored, along with Raphael Colantonio and Arcane Studios. You might have seen Dishonored. Uh, I am super happy to be here today. I've wanted to do a panel like this for quite a while. Uh, my favorite game company in all of history is uh, Looking Glass Technologies, and we're very fortunate today to have three people, so I'm gonna bring them up one at a time and tell you who they are, and then we're gonna go through a series of questions, then we're gonna do Q&A for you at the end. The first person uh, is Austin Grossman, who is a novelist and game designer. And uh, you might know the, the novel, Soon I Will Be Invincible, it's a super villain novel. Um, but I'll let Austin come on up and tell you what he's worked on. The second... The second person is Tom Leonard from Valve. He is a game designer and game programmer. And the last person is Emil Pagliarula, you might recognize from Skyrim and Fallout, the game designer and writer as well. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, Thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, um, I thought I would do a little thing like, if you're in the audience, raise your hand if there's one Looking Glass game that you count among your favorite games. <clears throat> and keep your hand up if there are two that you count among your favorite games. I'm gonna ask somebody to rattle off the game, so, so be honest. Three? Three games by Looking Glass that were your, your favorites? Like, uh, what, what are those three? System Shock, Thief 1, Thief 2, that's, that's a good answer. Anyway, so for a lot of us, uh, what? Flight yeah, Flight Unlimited, British Open Golf, like uh, Terra Nova, Underworld. Um, so let me, let me pull up my phone and go su through some questions here um, as we get rolling. I think one of the things that's really interesting about Looking Glass is this was a company of people who got together um, some people came out of MIT. Um, there was a very distinctive culture, and for a period of time, they made some games that I think are some of the most advanced games at the time, technologically and in terms of design. Uh, they took great leaps forward, and I think they were a very pivotal company. Um, it's amazing to see the run of games that Looking Glass had in, in sequence while the company was around. I mean, it's, it would be almost impossible to reproduce today, I think, for reasons we're gonna talk about. Um, but before we get going, why don't we go down the line and have each panelist uh, give you a brief uh, history of what they worked on at Looking Glass, what they're doing now, and say a little something about themselves. <clears throat> uh, hi, so I'm Austin Grossman. Uh, I started at Looking Glass uh, appallingly in 1992. Uh, I interviewed just about the day uh, that Ultima Underworld shipped. So I stayed to, on to work on uh, Ultima Underworld 2 and System Shock, and I hung around to Kibitz on Flight and uh, Terra Nova, um, <clears throat> uh, mostly doing writing and design for all of those. And uh, most recently, Austin wrote uh, the dialogue for Dishonored, by the way. Um, Tom Leonard. Uh, I started at Looking Glass in late 2000, sorry, 1995, and I was there until the year 2000. I worked on, did the AI for Thief and Thief 2 and uh, worked on all the other games that we shipped during that time. And since then, I joined Valve, and I worked on, did AI and, and game design for Half-Life 2 and the episodes. And most recently, the past few years, I've been focused on Left 4 Dead series. Um, I joined Looking Glass, I think in 1998, I was working for a, a game review website called The Adrenaline Vault, and I reviewed The, the Dark Project. Um, and that led to my first design job with Looking Glass, who was in my, you know, in my hometown. So uh, I was a designer on Thief 2 for two years and was there when the company closed. Now I'm at uh, Bethesda Game Studios. I've been there for like almost nine, almost actually 10 years this November. And um, I've done, uh, I was a lead designer in Fallout 3 um, and I do the, I'm a senior designer and writer on the Elder Scrolls stuff. And I, um, I did the Dark Brotherhood stuff um, and the Dragon Language stuff in Elder Scrolls. So great panel. Great guys, thanks for joining us. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we want to talk about before we dig into the questions with them is, uh, you know, if you look back on the games from Looking Glass, uh, not only, like I said, these technological leaps forward, but also 
uh, this very strong um, sense that the game should advance the, the art of game design and, uh, you know, should put the player in a location, a very cohesive world, um, that a lot of the game is happening in the player's head, uh, that there's a strong sense of you are there-ness, uh, this incredible run of games. So when Looking Glass broke up, the, the various people that worked there went in many different directions. And I think we'd all be shocked if we heard, like, where all of those people ended up and what they seeded across the industry and how important that was. So does one of you want to field that or a couple of you? Like, uh, you know, tell us some of the places where people from Looking Glass ended up and what they did after the company folded. Yeah. Well, I think maybe the two most successful um, places where people have gone uh, was Irrational is it was a spin-off out of Looking Glass. In fact, they were embedded inside the company when they did System Shock 2, which I also helped them on. And then um, uh, Harmonix. Uh, they existed but before Looking Glass broke up, but a lot of Looking Glass people who were musicians <laughs> moved over to Harmonix and helped build things like Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Yeah, weirdly, Bioshock and Rock Band are from part of the evolutionary tree that comes out of uh, the Looking Glass games. Uh, where did other people end up? I mean, obviously, besides Valve and Bethesda. Vicarious Visions, I know some guys ended up there as well. Yeah. Obviously, Ion Storm. Oh, that's, that's true, too. Ion Storm's Austin office had a, you know, we wanted to pick up the torch and, and run with some of the same values, the same way Arcane Studios does today. Um, there was a spin-off company called Multitude that did, uh, the, I think, one of the first action games with a voice component. I uh, worked there with Artman and Ned Lerner, one of the founders of uh, Looking Glass. Uh, or obviously, Junction Point with Warren Spector. They just did Epic Mickey, which I worked on. Uh, and together, uh, Seamus and I tanked uh, DreamWorks Interactive uh, <laughs> with Trespasser. And Clive Barker's Undying, which was not, not such a bad game. <laughs> um, any, any, any other place that you can think of that uh, was kind of seeded by Looking Glass? Well, Tiger Style, uh, uh, obviously. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Tiger Style. In Austin, there's a an indie game group called Tiger Style that won the iPhone game of the year a few years ago for the game Spider, and most recently they made the game Waking Mars. So, you know, even though the company folded, uh, these people that had shared this, uh, the guys that worked there, they shared this, like, incredible culture and this incredible uh, demand that they placed on themselves to make great games, and then they scattered throughout the industry, I think, enhancing parts of the industry, and in that way, their influence is, is still being felt, in addition to the the influence of games, like when people mention a game like Thief, which is now how many years old? It's 99 or something? Uh, 98. 98. Like a game that, that came out in 98 and people still cite it as one of their favorite games. Um, and the AI that, that Tom wrote for the game, coupled with the design components, the way the guards barked to give you, uh, or the way the guards talked to give you a sense of, um, you know, what their AI state was, so you could, like, use that feedback, that, that aural feedback to, to plan your next move. It was, like, just revolutionary. It's just one of the revolutionary touches that happened through these games. I just want to instill in you that, like, if you're a fan, you know this. If you're not, that some pivotal stuff happened that we all take for granted now through video games. It was worked out by a small group of people in Boston uh, or Cambridge, uh, technically. Somerville. No, Cambridge or Somerville. Yeah, Somerville. Okay. All right, so let's get to the questions we have here. Uh, first of all, how was that run of games even possible? Like, when I think about that today, when I think about trying to have, like, six, seven revolutionary games on both the tech front and the design front in a row right now, like, I don't even know how that's possible. Long hours. <laughs> Long hours, And lots yeah. of passion, a lot of passion within the company. There, there were people there working 120 hours at times to close a game, right? Four months on end, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say some very cranky, very smart people who uh, ended up working, you know, starting a game company at a very interesting uh, moment, right? It was just at the dawn of the first-person shooter. Uh, it was just at the dawn of uh, real-time uh, 3D, and there was just kind of a lot of low-hanging fruit if you were angry enough to seize that mm -hmm. fruit. Uh, yeah, that's <clears> actually a great point. The, Whenever a new movement happens, uh, or a new piece of technology, a new genre, uh, the people that are in it initially, there's a lot of like room for innovation. There's a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit, I guess, is the best way to put it. But it was more than that. I mean, like a lot of the people who joined Looking Glass came straight out of MIT, so it was like 
incredibly smart group of people, and guys like Doug Church was so energized at the time. Whenever you talk to him, every conversation with Doug was like a, a training session, like, you know, like shotgunned into a five-minute uh, interval because he was so passionate about what games could be. They could be more than room hallway, room hallway with a, a monster that you kill at the end of the hall and a scripted event opens the door or whatever. But, but back to the question, like any, any other contributing factor of why you think that was possible then, it's not possible now? Is it a lot of a lot of good minds in one room. I, I remember when I first came there, I it was actually when I started Look Glass, it was very intimidating for me because I had worked remotely for the previous two years. So I really hadn't worked in an office with people for a long time. And so coming into Looking Glass, I didn't know there were so many MIT people there. And it was very intimidating for me. It was like my, I called it my goodwill hunting moment, like the kid from South Boston is now surrounded by all the MIT guys and has to make good. Um, but I was shocked at how smart everyone was. And, and not just smart in the academic sense, you know, it actually burst a stereotype for me, but the creativity right. in one building was just off the charts. And so for me, the two years I was at Looking Glass was, I can really consider my, those like my grad school, you know, was, I learned a lot. There, that, uh, I, that, res, that comment resonates with me about the intimidation moment, because I never actually worked at Looking Glass. I worked with Origin as the lead tester of System Shock for 10 months, and then I worked at a spinoff after that, uh, Multitude, for a year and a half. But that intimidation factor, like when I visited or when you interacted with the team, everybody was so fast and so they had their own language that, to talk about games with, which we talked about last night as a pivotal part of a culture uh, working out ideas, and it, it was just an intellectually intimidating. Uh, I interviewed for the job of associate producer on Terra Nova, and at the same time, I was going to go work there, and at the same time, Origin offered me a uh, producer position on my own game, an RTS that eventually got killed. So I, to this day, wonder whether I made the wrong decision by staying at Origin. But I got there for the interview. They picked me up. We went and had some food. We, we're going to go visit the office. We're walking down the hall to the front door. We got to the front uh, door of the looking glass office, the, there's obviously a lock and a, a keypad, and I'm waiting to be let into the office to do my job interview, and Art Man goes, wait, he, he stops whoever Ned was going to enter the code or whatever, he says, wait, he's like, Harvey, what's the code? And I was just like, you know, this is my first trip to Boston, like I, I never visited the studio, and in a flash of inspiration, I entered uh, 0451, because that was the first code in System Shock, which was an allusion to Fahrenheit 451, and all that, somehow, I was so intimidated, I was so scared, that all that flashed in my head at once, and the door opened, and I was just like, oh my God, did I, did I almost lose the job because of this, you know, this little uh, test, but, so yeah, it was intimidating. I think um, there are a couple other factors of why the company did what it did. Uh, one was, as it grew, continuing to be very selective about their hiring, I remember when I interviewed uh, Ned, you remind me of this, he's, he's going to love me telling this story to the world, but uh, he was the last interview of the day, and um, he, I got into his office, and, and he launched in at me so aggressively, where he got up and was up on his desk yelling at me, can you walk on water? Can you walk on water? He, like, there was, he was, it's very selective, and then, then the thing that was ultimately, I think, the company's Achilles heel was a desire at every iteration to push the envelope and make something new and make a new IP, uh, which is why we had so many different and diverse games, but I think as the industry matured, it was also why we were kind of in a tough position vis-a-vis -vis other companies that were more focused on what they were doing. I think Origin hit that too, where like you looked around and it was like there's Wing Commander, Ultima, Bioforge, there was a World War I flight sim going, and it was just like the focus started to, to, to go away because there were so many people there with strong opinions who wanted to do something, and everybody just went in a different direction. I was working on an RTS, you know, like, so that uh, I could see that. When I was doing the gaming press stuff, and I, I first contacted Looking Glass to do preview some stuff, they're like, sure, we can show you this game Flight Unlimited 2. It's like, okay, great. I had no interest in it. I, seriously, I was in that office trying to s catch a glimpse of any thief stuff I, I possibly could. And people forget that, you know, the stealth genre, there was no stealth genre before Thief the Dark Project. You know, there was Splinter Cell now and there, but that was a progenitor, you know? And so for me, the idea of that game was so new and so different. Like, a game where you just sneak around, you actually hide in the shadows, yeah. you can do that in a game? How does that even work? Yeah, you know? we talk about that with Dishonored somehow. There's the power fantasy of 
killing monsters. Monsters are these scary things out in the world, and you go through mastery uh, by conquering the things you're afraid of, right? Games do that pretty well. There's the, the power fantasy of flying, but there's another more subtle power fantasy, which is like, you're in a place where you're not supposed to be, and no one knows you're there. You're powerful in this way, where you're like hiding behind the pillar or whatever. And uh, I got that so much from Thief, and it, it broadened my mind just playing the game. I was like suddenly aware that this, this other realm of like uh, engagement with the player's mind was even possible. Uh, before we move on to the other question, I'd like to throw one more thing out because in addition to conversations about cost structures changing, today you couldn't do that because games would be so insanely expensive uh, and all the other things you guys mentioned, which are great points. There's something else I noticed about Looking Glass from the outside that I thought was quite special. It was definitely a game design company and it was definitely a technology company. And to some extent it was a music company because there were a lot of musicians there. But also something I noticed was it was a literary company. Like the games have such a strong literary sensibility. When you play System Shock, you know like, like there was this crazy moment in System Shock where I'd played the game over and over and over, obviously. And like, you know, I had read all these logs about the head of maintenance and uh, how, you know, his eye was, uh, or, you know, he had the, the access to get through the, the, into this one area with the, the retinal scanner. And like I found his head in a place and took it over and used it as the key to open the retinal scanner to get in the door. And every inch of the game was fictionally rich. It was fictionally dense. It's, it's uh, in addition to many other values that we share with Looking Glass, Raphael Colantonio and I, that's, that's one of the things we're pushing all the time, is like, let's just have this world that seems much larger than it actually is to the player. But do you guys have any comment about what you think of the, the literary qualities of the company? Well, nothing says literary like a severed head and a retinal scanner. <laughs> as I think James Joyce would agree. <laughs> well, I mean, like, Doug is like, you know, game design guy, math guy, and then on top of that can, like, you know, talk to you about Faulkner, you know, can talk to you about, uh, you know, different books. And it, it always felt like even the Thief game with its more minimalist aesthetic, like there was a very strong sense of setting and character factions and the politics in the background. And um, I think it's possible to approach the Looking Glass games from that angle as well. I think, um, you know, part of a good game design is um, getting the player into this headspace where, you, you know, if you look at Thief 1 in particular, I mean, it's not a particularly pretty game. Uh, I, I downloaded it on Steam a few weeks ago and played it again. And it's definitely long in the tooth visually, but there are other tools besides visuals that you have, and having a strong fiction kind of gets the player in the right headspace so that they kind of ignore where you can, they can see behind the set a little bit because they're, they're kind of going with the flow. But there was not a strong sense of fiction in, in the sense that long-winded conversations were shoved down your throat or cinematic scenes that you had to watch that were non-interactive or whatever. It was somehow baked organically into the, the very world itself. It was a time, too, when games, you know, first-person games and shooters were tended to have a bit more story than they do, you know, that when the, the genre, the first-person shooter genre and then the first-person sneaker genre, whatever you want to call it, you know, it, it was, you know, Garrett would speak to you, uh, you know, automatically as you walk. So you got a sense of his character. And, and uh, I mean, you could read the books in game, but it was very, um, they were, there was definitely a sense of the, like you said, the world was alive. And, and to this day, I think it's a miracle that the city has actually never been named or yeah. located. I think it's one of the great credits of the people looking glass. Um, but I mean, I had, a, so I, knowing that actually who started working on Thief 2, I, I could sense how literary it was. And I, I was trying to find inspiration. And, I realized that the fiction and the world was closer to um, Dickens uh, than, as I had a copy of Oliver Twist on my desk throughout the course of development, and that was sort of my, you know, my background for my go-to. Well, when we, God, when you use the lit word literary, I, like, I think to myself, no wonder we, we didn't make any money. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the lessons, I mean, I, I, I think we learned, or I learned, uh, because Looking Glass was running at the same time that id Software was running. And I, the, one of the lessons I, I, I think we all learned from Doom was that, like, uh, Doom, I felt like it came out during a period when games were kind of choked with story. And then, like, everybody felt relieved that they could just run forward at, at, at a fast pace and nobody would stop the, to talk to them about their village. Uh, <laughs> 
so, I mean, uh, and I think that taught us a, 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 a huge lesson, which is that we, we did want to do games with, with story in an immersive world, but we, want, but we I think, learned over time to make that, the, that, that, that narrative quality ambient in the world rather than simply uh, uh, fed through dialogue. Uh, and I think, I mean, uh, System Shock does that, does that well, Thief does that very well. Um, so I would, I would qualify, you know, the, the adjective literary by, by saying sort of in a, in a kind of ambient, you're soaking in it sort of way. It's a great point, and we, we talk about that for Dishonored off and on. Um, we obviously try to use every trick in the bag, but we, we use the term pull-based narrative, right? Like lessons we've learned from Bioshock and from Thief and games like that where there is a lot of story. There's a strong sense of world. There's a strong sense of the characters that are there, but somebody is not preaching to you about that all the time. It's like... Often it's written on the wall of their office, or it's like found in the items that decorate their area. Um, so, uh, you know, I know you guys rely on that a lot for the Elder Scrolls as well, visual storytelling. So, it, so there is a strong sense of story and place and character, but it's ambient to use your term. Right, and uh, you know, I, I think it gets back to one of the qualities that made Looking Glass interesting, because when we got done with Under, Ultima Underworld 2, nobody ever wanted to see another menu-based conversation ever again, and we thought to ourselves, you know, okay, we've inherited the conventions of this role-playing world, but we're working in real time, and it's just, it's just the worst thing. Every time we, we interact with a character, we're pulled out of the 3D world that we, you know, worked so hard to build, and so... Uh, uh, thrilling. So, you know, it, you, looking last, you know, everybody was kind of uh, smart and cranky, and we just decided, okay, let's just tear down all the, all the RPG stuff that is driving us crazy and see if we can build a story-driven world without those conventions that are clearly kind of uh, yeah. hamstringing our game. So the solution they came up with was everybody on Citadel Station is dead. All the characters are dead. You can find their bodies, you can find their notes, you can find their audio recordings, you can listen to the last moments of their life. It was very powerful. Can I see a show of hands? Who played System Shock when it came out? It's a small number of people. It was one of the most magical experiences I've ever had. It, uh, it was a pivotal game. It, it taught everybody in the industry something about games. And I remember all the flame wars between fans about whether it was an RPG or not. You know, and it's just like, wow, if you back up and you look at like what a role-playing game is supposed to be, you're in an environment, you take on a role, What's interesting about that, about, you know, having everyone be dead and so you, you, you lose the, you know, you don't have dialogue and all that stuff. That's one of the things that challenges us all the time, you know, working on the Elder Scrolls stuff on Fallout 3 is we can write dialogue. How much should we write? You know, we can write in-game books. How many should we write? Are we going to drown? It, it's more of a problem with the, you know, the dialogue and how we tell the story because it's so easy when you, and the, our tools are pretty robust. I mean, you can write dialogue and it's in the game immediately and so... It's, it becomes a bit of a crutch because you can implement you can implement it and iterate on it so quickly, you find yourself writing a lot of dialogue and then the visual storytelling gets thrown out the window and it, it's really to the game's detriment sometimes. And so we have those tools. It's like we have this great tool we have to force ourselves not to use for the reasons you stated. Nothing is so eloquent as a blood trail, I always say. Yeah, I mean... Uh, we're about to move on to the next question, but like I remember talking to Matthias Vorch, who was working on Dead Space 2, and he loved the Looking Glass games as well and was influenced by them, I think. And he told this story about how he wanted to do this area where there's a train station leaving the space base or whatever it is, the moon base. And, and initially there's like, you know, an initial loading area where you can see the glass windows where you would buy tickets and you could see the turnstiles and things like that. And then it leads to another area, it kind of funnels down to another area, to another train track where like you get to the next stage of security check or whatever, and there'd be like a knocked over suitcase just sitting there. And then there's another area beyond that, which is like a kind of waiting area along the way to the train, and there, were like, there was like a bloody handprint on the wall and a shoe. And then the, the next area, like you see one more suitcase after another spilled open, and then finally you get to a place where there are bodies and things. And like, as you move through this space without anybody using any text or, or feeding you any cutscenes or any of that, you're, if you're paying attention, if you're that kind of player, exploring and listening, you're inferring from the world what happened here with this terrible scene. And I think that stuff is so powerful. And it, it was so fresh back then too, now not so much. So now it's like, how many blood trails can I get away with using? You know, it's actually, I have to ask myself, yeah. how many bloody handprints or corpse notes, you know, can I get away with? 
Yep, a lot is the answer. Yeah, true <laughs> enough. Uh, okay, next question. We we're talking kind of about a value of the game, but like I just would be curious if you guys go down the line and like off the top of your head, if you said, maybe it wasn't premeditated, but in retrospect, like two or three core values of Looking Glass Studios, Looking Glass Technologies. Well, for me, it's, it's the dirty word that, you, you know, it's, it's become a joke now, but immersion, you know what immersion. I mean? Immersion. Which you, I, it's, and I realize what, you know, people bandy that word about, and you, it's hard to know what it means, but for me, that is very closely tied to a, a first-person experience, you know, um, where you are the character, you're not controlling the character. Um, and especially with Thief, I mean, you, back then, Thief, PC only, you play it with headphones, you turn the lights out. I mean, people don't know this, that the, the Thief pit uh, was called the dark pit. And I mean, literally, there, there were black sheets on the windows to prevent sunlight from coming in because of the glare on the monitor. Um, and it was very, just very dark and gloomy, and that actually, it's almost like clinical depression in a way, you know, sanctioned clinical depression, you know, it's yeah. like you just really drawing within yourself. I mean, I'd say, I'd say one thing is um, sort of empowering the player to kind of make decisions on, you know, as they play through, uh, you know, improvise plans rather than kind of spell it out for them. Within some constraint, I mean, Thief was kind of this game where it expanded and contracted in terms of the player possibility because it had to move along to somewhere. That word is, is one of my favorite words in game design is imp improvisation. Uh, for me and Raphael and the team at Arcane, it's like the holy grail when a player can combine these tools he has in Dishonored and come up, because the tools are consistent, come up with a solution to a problem that we didn't even know about. I see it off and on. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a good one too. Like. Uh, I I would say, we, you know, the, this sort of burning sense that the medium that we, ha we are working in is great, but it is incomplete. And thinking of the best and strongest and, and uh, moments that, s that stay with us, you know, in the games that we played and, uh, and trying to articulate, you know, what made them so powerful. Because we know the medium is powerful, but at the same time, we know the, the medium isn't doing everything it could. We feel that sense of potential. And there was always that sense of, of trying to look to the next thing or... Uh, Try to you know articulate the thing we don't quite understand about the medium that that holds us and 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 make it concrete and powerful and, and make that emotion realize itself uh, better in the next in the next version in the next generation. Yeah, that sort of sense of challenging yourself you could feel that from anybody you talk to at Looking Glass. It's a it's a great one. I'm I'm surprised none of you know, uh, mentioned technology because a few years before Underworld changed my life. Like Underworld was like the way some people point to a particular music album or whatever, uh, and I know this is true of my partner, Rafael Colantonio, as well. Both of us were just lit up by under, Ultima Underworld, like an amazing experience, and I could go on for an hour about how great it was, but just a couple of years before that, we were playing games where you were on a grid and you could only move one square at a time, and Looking Glass made Underworld, and it was this huge leap, but I remember playing System Shock one day and I was near a very organic hallway that was faceted with uh, bio growth or whatever, whatever it was called at the time. But like these, this faceted curved organic hallway and I had an EMP rifle that fired a big sphere of glowing energy that had physics that bounced. I know this doesn't sound like a big deal today, but like I fired that gun down the hall and the ball goes out rotating and glowing and all the facets lit up as it went down the hall and it banked, it bounced and went around the corner and I saw the light disappear around the corner. And it was like my life changed because I realized here is the application of lighting technology against polys and physics with bounce and path. I can make a bank shot with this weapon and yet at the same time it is aesthetically beautiful. So the technology, every, every one of the games had some new technology in the service of player empowerment an amazing component of the games, I thought. It was a great place for multitasking programmers slash designers slash artists. I think that was one of the, one of the core strengths of it, was that uh, programmers uh, and everybody sort of took responsible, responsibility for a lot of aspects of the, of the play experience. Yeah. All right, uh, let me switch gears for a second and say, uh, does anybody believe that the uh, modern games with their graphical fidelity and drive toward photorealism has held back innovation in design. Does anybody have a comment on that? That's a common argument in games. Uh, 
All right, I guess I have two points about that. One is that my current three favorite games are uh, Minecraft, Dwarf Fortress, uh, and Dishonored. Uh, and I, I, you know, the excellence of those games is, is, is thoroughly graphics independent. Uh, um, so you know, I, I, I don't think I don't think that at all, actually. Particularly if you remember, how much can I cuss? Uh, <laughs> um, you can raise your hand if you were a nun. <laughs> This is one nun back there, so I think we're safe. Oh, I uh -huh. mean, uh, the shock, re the system shock and underworld renderer, it was brilliant in this day, but damn it, it was horrible to work with. <laughs> oh my god, we didn't have arbitrarily shaped polygons. Every, you know, every, you know, square foot of a room slowed the renderer down. It was awful. Uh, um, I, I, I don't think I, uh, you know, it was, it was great, but uh, I feel perfectly well empowered by better renderers. Yeah, I, I personally, I'm kind of a pluralist. Like, I, I've never thought games were really in danger. I think games are going to continue fragmenting. New types of players, new goals for games, educational simulations like mobile games, like big, deep uh, strategy games. Uh, you know, you could look at EVE Online. There's the entirely player-driven game. And I can cite examples where I think the team was chasing photorealism. Far Cry 2, one of my favorite games of all time. One of my favorite shooters of all time. Probably in my top 15 of, of, of game of all time. I just, I had so many great experiences with Far Cry 2, it's unbelievable. So it is a, it's a graphical, high fidelity game for sure. I think you have to ask yourself, why was there a push for graphic fidelity like that, right? Because the consumers demanded it, right? And, and I mean, as a game developer, what do you want? You want people to play your games. And so, I mean, the Elder Scrolls, Fall 3, you know, we. We concentrate on making them look pretty, you know? We want people to, you know, that draws people in. People are, you know, the game has to look good and it, it, it gets more people playing your game, which ultimately is what you want, right? Also, I think um, high fidelity graphics is different than art direction, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we could have, when we did Left 4 Dead, made a very realistic looking environment. We wanted to go for sort of this slightly off setting, a little grittier to allow us to have the ridiculousness that occurs in the game not be, feel strange. Or if you look at like TF, uh, another game where, yeah, you know, it's art direction that. I mean, Dishonored is, is the same way. Like I think both of our companies have worked with Viktor Antonov, and um, you know, there's that slightly stylized thing that allows you to. It almost allows the player to project more onto the world. Uh, but in any case, I think all those those possibilities are there. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say something else about the graphical fidelity thing. Any other, any other comments on that while we're, while we're on it? Um, if you had to cite, um, you know, the average game, like what sets apart the games that people play and they, that become a part of their life and they talk about them for a decade versus the kind of games that come and go and everybody just thinks that they're like, well, that was a game, I've rented it or I played it or whatever and I'm not going to think about it much more and move on. Like, what is the thing that's missing? Because this is something I, I feel that the Looking Glass games grab people by the heart, by the mind, and stayed with them for many, many years. We're sitting here on a stage, we're still talking about Underworld, System Shock, Thief. Um, you know, th there's a difference. Uh, what, what is missing from the games that you, you check out? And ig ignore the ones that are buggy or didn't get enough time or, um, or, or whatever along those lines. But let's say... Uh, talk about a finished game versus another finished game, and one grabs you. And what, what are some of those qualities that Looking Glass games had? Well, I mean, the moment comes when, you, when you're in a game and you feel that you owned your own experience. You're, you have an experience that you yourself created. And it may be in the most linear, you know, pre-baked pre game in the world, but you can say to yourself, you know what, I finished that level using, you know, four bullets. I set myself that challenge. And then that's, that's a story I can tell about what I wanted to do and what I accomplished and how I figured out how to do it. Some games enable that more than others, you know, systems-driven, uh, games flexible, games... Uh, give you more scope for doing that. But that's, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's the thing you remember. That's the thing yeah. I remember. And that's, that's the little story, you know, you can tell. You know, I remember when I did that. I, I feel like I ought to be jumping up and down saying, amen, brother, amen, in the background, because uh, on both the Deus Ex games and on Dishonored, uh, and I know for Raphael, it's true, too, for Arx Fatalis and Dark Messiah, the games that Arcane has worked on before I signed on, like, we're constantly looking at this thing where, like, Okay, spatially speaking, there are different pathways you could take. You could go over the rooftop, you could go through the window, the back alley, the front door, possess a fish and swim around back and, 
and come up through the drainage chute. So spatially, there, there are options. The powers you chose might be different than the powers I chose. You found more runes than I did. You focus on possession. I focus on stopping time, whatever. The powers are different. Uh, your moral compass might be different. I might have tried to kill everybody. You tried to literally kill nobody, complete the game without killing anybody. I used a lot of stealth. You went straight in for direct combat. Plus, the AI is variable, like taking a, a page from Thief. It's not just they know about you or they don't know about you. They may know about you. They may have heard you. They may be suspicious coming to check out whether you're actually there or not. On the way, uh, if, they're, if they're just patrolling, they may look and say, well, my squad, under the hood, my squad is responsible for these three patrol routes, and that one hasn't been patrolled in a while. I'm going to go over there. And along the way, they might pass a fireplace and say, you know what? I haven't warmed my hands in a while. I'm going to warm my hands. They pass a piece of art, and they look at it and go, ah, that's a piece of shit. I don't like it. But they, but they do these little things. They're dynamically pulled off their course. The point here is, when you stack all those layers, and they're not on discrete tracks, they're all possible all the time, and you go through the game, and at some point you climb up on a wall and accidentally knock a bottle over, and a guard hears it and says, hey, what was that? Comes around the corner, and you have to improvise to get away from that guy. And meanwhile, I didn't even go over there because I possessed a fish and swam through the water, and, and uh, you know, I was killing everybody. I wasn't trying to avoid the guards. Like, your micro story, your moment-to-moment -moment emergent narrative, based on your actions plus the interaction of all the systems, is fundamentally different than anyone else in the room. You'd be hard-pressed to play a level of one of these games and have the exact experience everyone else had. For me, the big difference in the Looking Glass stuff when, when I first got there, I mean, when I played Thief and then when I worked there, is, you know, I had played games before, I have played games since, but the Looking Glass stuff, you could tell that the people who made these games uh, believed in their worlds. Um, the worlds are consistent. Um, there are no... Easter eggs or pop culture references. In jokes. In jokes, right, exactly. It's, it, you, you play Thief, you play System Shock, it's like you are in that place. There are no, yeah. no winks, no nods, you know, uh, and that's the, that's the biggest thing that I've taken away. Um, it's a great one. You know, going forward on the stuff at, at Bethesda, you know, trying, like, make the world feel like a real place because right. once you break that illusion, you're, you know, you're killing the immersion or, you know, ruining the experience in some ways. I remember the first person who ever said, don't break the fiction to me was Doug Church. And I, it took me a minute to understand what he meant. You know, I was, I was that new to the industry. Uh, and I've tried to apply that subsequently on Deus Ex and Dishonored. But, you know, like you can be funny in a game. You can be, um, you, can, you can make the player laugh, but you can do that within the cohesive space of the game's fiction. Right. <clears throat> I'll never forget in, in Fallout 3, which you worked on, uh, going down a street with a ruined series of houses all burned out and just opening up one of the mailboxes for whatever reason. And there was a letter to the family that lived there that their application to go to the vault had been denied, uh, that there was no more room in the vault in their area, and so they were going to have to find some other solution. And the house just burned out in the background, and it was like simultaneously so sad and so funny, but in no way did it break the fiction. It seemed exactly like the kind of thing that you could find in a mailbox you know, after, after the bomb in, in Fallout, you know. So I've, I've carried that lesson. That's a great one, too. It's important to find, you know, find how you can do that in, what, in, in your game, what works for your game. And for us, it's the dark humor that, you know, yeah. every things that are, the, in Fallout 3, the things that tended to be the, the most miserable and depressing were also the funniest, you know. It, that's the way it worked out. Um, any other values you think that, like, consistent across Looking Glass games? Or, or rather, let me broaden it. A game that stays in your mind for years versus... I, I love both of those answers. Um, well, as sort of an AI programmer, um, one of the things that I always remind myself is that I'm there to entertain the player and to make the player feel like he's a hero she or she and make them feel like they were smart, even if they did the thing I wanted them to do anyway. So, I mean, whether it's a hyper-linear game you know, or a completely open-ended game, if the player doesn't feel like... The, they're the, they're the hero of the story, of the story or the, the, the space, then, yeah. then uh, they're, they're not going to remember it, I don't think. I remember reading people at Valve saying player acknowledgement. You know, it was a very powerful tool. You know, one more thing, too. It, it occurred to me that, you know, not only was, you know, Thief the, the progenitor of the stealth genre, but it, it did stealth better than probably any other game that's come since. So it's like, I mean, you know, there's, there was stealth in Fall 3, stealth in Oblivion and, and Skyrim, and we 
you know, we started off looking at Thief, and I'm sure you guys did too, and it's like, you know, it's almost like finding an ancient artifact and try to decide, you know, how did they create this? What, you know, what, what's the secret? You know, how did they do it? And there's a yeah, lot of magic in there. that deconstruction is yeah. obviously useful. Uh, I feel like we're, we're eating into some of the time that we're going to save for the Q&A, and I really want to preserve that. So I'm going to skip a couple of the questions I have and just ask for, like, one of you to answer a couple of things. Uh, do contentious teams that argue a lot make better games? I would say, I mean, personal experience, the one thing I love about Bethesda is that I've been working with the same guys now for nine year, years. So, I mean, we have our squabbles, but they're like, you know, the squabbles that you would have with your family members. So I really can't imagine working with a contentious team and making a good game. I, I, it sounds like it would suck. I mean, so, I'd say intellectually contentious, right? Yeah. Like Valve it's, is not a contentious atmosphere, but we all have our ideas and our passions and we're... Like, passionate, respectful debate about why the player would enjoy this versus that, versus like just dysfunctional fighting. Yeah, that's a, that's a good clarification, I guess. Like, by the way, you're from Southie, right? Did you almost, you almost said years, right? What, what, it, it slips out, yeah. You corrected yourself on the fly, I love that. Um, okay, like before we turn it over to the audience, uh, uh, I had two more questions, but let me just ask one. Like, if you have a favorite moment culturally, this is, this is a little more indulgent. It's not so much about the craft of making games or whatever, but like if you have a favorite moment at Looking Glass, like emotionally, the time you were there, either in terms of what you learned or how you felt working with somebody else or something that happened, give us an anecdote. Uh, for me, uh, you know, shipping Thief 2 was great, but for me, my proudest moment was, um, I, so I did the Thief 2 demo, which was, um, the life of the party mission. It was um, uninvited guest. Which I forget. We changed the name for either one. But the, it was the rooftop stuff with the party and that and I, the, the demo that went out. And so for me, that was like the first time I had ever done anything that you know the the public had played. Um, and that was incredibly exciting. And that I'll, it was just like, wow, this is what it feels like to to work on something and have people play it. It's not just you know my buddy playing my. Duke 3D deathmatch level, you know? This yeah, is it, it's fascinating. Like, musicians get to step up on stage and play an instrument and watch the audience react at real time. Um, but, and, and filmmakers can sit in the crowd and watch everybody's reaction and know they're supposed to laugh at this moment and cry at that moment. But for a video game, you release it. And for a long time, without so much social media, it was just like, it's out there in the world and people are like rabbited in their, their rooms in the dark with the headphones on going through it. They're, they're literally inside your work moving yeah. through it and it's inside them affecting them emotionally. Right. But it's like, it's a weird thing when you finally get that validation that people love your work and they're moved by it. I think for me it was uh, early in 1998 when the Thief team finally really gelled completely and we realized that we weren't crazy, <laughs> that we were gonna make a game that we thought could be good. And it, the trust that was there was what really brought home when, uh, in February of that year, I, I um, approached Greg LaPiccolo, uh, who was the project director, uh, I was the lead programmer, and I said, Greg, I have to delete the AI and write a new one, because now we understand what the game is, and... Man, if you're near the end of a project and your lead programmer comes to you and says, I have to delete the AI, <laughs> you know, it's just like, <laughs> someone put him in chains, put him in the closet, you know, that's Greg's, most of the company. jaw, he gave me this look, <laughs> he's like, okay, and they, I locked myself in a room for... Three weeks and did Three it. Three weeks, yeah. And to have that trust in, within the team was... was that's great. amazing. And you, you only understood the design that you guys had worked out well enough near the end to know that, that if you had started over on the AI, you could have served the player much better, I guess. Is. Which actually brings me to one thing from an earlier question. One of the characteristics that was prevalent inside Looking Glass that I think some companies, because of being beholden to contracts with their publishers or whatnot, uh, was this underlying courage to do the right thing, even if it was dangerous and risky, like deleting the AI or, or re redoing a system yeah. three weeks before shipping. That's, That's a crazy story. I'd never heard that before. I don't think that would ever happen today. Not no, it wouldn't happen. Well, but yeah. <laughs> We're too safe today. I like that, that courage to do the right thing, no matter what, like, it's a fine line. Like, Raf and I, we have a super talented executive producer, Julian Roby, who also understands that balance. And the three of us get together and we, like, we, we take risks here and there, like, for the better of the game. And, but Looking Glass was crazy. I remember um, I had worked on System Shock with him for like 10 months. The last month or so of, of System Shock, Doug sat in my cubicle with a guy named James. They were working on that VR headset stuff. 
It was really cool to be in 1994 or whatever to, to see that stuff. But on System Shock CD, which I, the reason I worked on it for 10 months with those guys, just as a tester, by the way, just supporting them, uh, was that we rolled straight out of the floppy into the CD, and the CD was way better. It had voice for all the audio files, et cetera. But like on, toward the tail end of that, there was a version 1.1, 1.14, uh, or whatever was like the version we thought we were shipping. And we discovered a pretty bad bug in it that would not have been noticed by most players. It would not have crashed the game. It wouldn't have prevented us from shipping. It was just a vanity thing for the team. Like it was, I don't remember exactly what it was actually. And Doug, we talked about it, and Doug talked to the team about it. And then he came back to me through email and said, I have attached a file to this email. Save it back to your hard, or save it to your desktop or whatever, and then like, make the CD image and drop this on top of the CD image, then burn it and send it off. And I was just like, terrible. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. There's, you know, and, and, but I did it. I was like, are you sure? And he was like, yeah, go for it. You know, and so we did it. And I was, I, you know, I think I was taking the risk of getting fired, and I think he was taking a big risk with his game. And, but it was just like, I don't remember exactly what the feature was, but it was like some little thing that was really important to everyone aesthetically. And, uh, and so, you know, the version that went out was like, 1.16 or something like that because we dropped an extra file in and iterated on it or whatever. But uh, do, you, do you have an anecdote before we turn it over to the audience? Mm. Uh, well, okay, two really, two really quick ones. One was I think my personal sort of baby at Looking Glass was the log system in System Shock. And sort of the first time we, we heard the audio logs coming on and, you know, creeping through the, system, through the, through the space station and realizing you could, you could hear those characters and, you know, feel their stories without, you know, without interrupting the gameplay, without breaking... Uh, real, uh, the realism of it, and realizing that we, that we could make a, a, a cool decision and, and change the medium, because I could, I could feel that this worked in a way that things hadn't worked before in the, in the, in the medium, dis despite the fact that I ripped it off from Pool of Radiance. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, it, just, that, just that feeling that, God, we're, we're in a young me medium where you can do new things and, uh, and uh, God, create a, a piece of art that, that, that's never been there before. And I think the other one is, is just day one when I came in to interview and I, 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 you know, I opened the door and I had interviewed at some shitty publishing jobs and then there was this and it was a room full of Nerf toys and then Doug was there with his laptop and he was still in his sleeping bag working mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, this is awesome and I thought, oh, being a grown-up can be awesome. It does not have to suck. You can do awesome things. That's fantastic, yeah. There was a lot of bare feet and a lot of pajama bottoms uh, at, at Looking Glass and t-shirts worn for four or five days in a row, right? Like Origin had a very similar culture for better or worse. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, I, I have to say first, thank you guys for not only doing, agreeing to do this and sharing this, but also for the games you've made before and afterward. Your contribution is huge. Um, but I really am interested if we have time still uh, I'm interested in turning this over to the audience and catching a few questions. Can we do that now? Uh, back here, uh, Matt's holding up a mic. So if you have a question for any of the guys that worked at Looking Glass or a Deus Ex question or whatever, fire away. Even a dishonored question would be okay, but let's focus on Looking Glass. If you could, uh, if you could get control of one Looking Grass property and make a new game out of it, which one would you give? British Open Golf. <laughs> it never met its potential. <laughs> you know what? I, a thief would be the obvious answer for me, but I don't think that's true anymore because when we, I was working on Thief, I really wanted to make an assassin game, so I've gotten to sort of exercise those demons with the Dark Brotherhood and Elder Scrolls. I've always thought that Terra Nova would be, could be, I mean, it's, you know, it's seen life again sort of as tribes a little bit, you know, but there was something special about Terra Nova that was never really fully realized that I, I would love to get my hands on that. I mean, I would happily work on Thief. I really enjoyed the AI challenge there, and I think trying to do a new generation of that would be interesting. Uh, it would be Shock. Uh, I originally pitched System Shock as uh, a story about a teenage girl who's living in the asteroid belt and runs away from home and finds this crazy space station. And I, I still want, at the time, I think Paul was like, a girl? We can't have a video game starring a girl. Uh, but I, I would still love to go back and do that. Yeah, I think System Shock would be, if I could wave a magic wand and own something, it would be System Shock. I would love to do the prequel. 
like where the last minutes are like Shodan going sentient and betraying the crew and everybody, you know, I, I think that would be fantastic. But It would be your Prometheus. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next question. Uh, first off, just want to say thanks. Uh, Terra Nova and actually System Shop is probably my favorite game ever. Um, my question is, today's game seems like they're very afraid of putting content in there that players won't see. Um, don't want to create anything that's missed. And that's something about the games from Origin and Looking Glass. They felt like they, there's so much in the world um, that you could miss and then talk about with other friends. You see it in Fallout and some of the, the, and the uh, other games from, like, from Elder Scrolls. Is that such a huge uh, problem these days that do you think games are going to go more that way? About, or do you think there are enough people who are brave enough to, to create games with content that may not be seen by everyone, but so this the dedicated is the, fans are there? This is the classic question. I remember being at Origin and arguing a little bit with Richard Garriott, Lord British, another mentor and another great guy, another pivotal game figure. Because I was a young, naive player at the time, and I was like, I want the game where I play it and I finish it, and I've only seen 10% of the content. And Richard was like, Ultimas are based on you go through it and you only see some subset of the content, but we can't make a game where 90% of the content is not seen because to make a game long enough, we'll, we'll be working six years on this game. So this is an ongoing argument that comes up. We, we certainly believe that at Arcane, that you shouldn't be able to see all the content in one pass. You guys follow that with the Elder Scrolls, but what, what do you guys say about that? Uh, for us, it actually, um, I mean, there's definitely some awesome stuff in Fall 3 and, and Skyrim that you've never seen, right? I, uh, but that actually sort of works to our advantage because there's, there's stuff that one player, one player playing through the game will not have seen everything. But what, whatever he missed, his buddy may have seen, you know? And then they talk about it. And then it feels like they're having two totally different experiences in the same game. So uh, that's actually sort of worked to our advantage, that you don't, that there is stuff out there that, and it, there's, and it keeps alive the sense of exploration, uh, that you know that there's something out there you haven't seen yet and you want to find it. Yeah, I, I totally believe that and share that value. But I'm, I'm curious, like Tom, your company Valve seems to have a very different approach to that. Well, it uh, depends on the series. I mean, the multiplayer games, we, like, Left 4 Dead, there's definitely stuff that we didn't care if you see it because we knew if you liked the game, you would eventually see it. Yeah. Uh, whereas working on Half-Life 2 um, and the episodes, the, the, co the sheer cost of creating the track yeah. uh, made it per discourage us from doing it. But I think it was also a philosophical thing from Half-Life 1, which was, you know, we would like the player to experience, you know, everything that we put in front of them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's less about courage and more about costs. And, and then there is that design philosophy, like, you know, you can either show the player a great time by putting them on the best roller coaster they've ever been on, or you can show them a great time by, you know, the same way when you were 15 and you and two friends broke into an abandoned building down the street and explored it. Like, those are very different, but those are both viable experiences. Uh, the good news uh, for redundant content is text is cheap. <laughs> uh, so you can put a lot of opt-in content in written books and uh, no, one, uh, no one has to uh, shell out an additional million. Uh, can we get another question? Uh, we've got time for one left, so. One more? We're, we're trying to make them into two <laughs> questions into one. So. All right, well, I was gonna open up with just one real quick uh, comment, which is that in my career so far, I've actually gotten to work with a couple of uh, Looking Glass alumni, and to a person, they've been a great influence on me and just fantastic to work with and I can definitely see where those games came from. You guys definitely meet their standards so thank you very much for doing this panel. Um, the question I had was of all the studios going right now what reminds you the most of Looking Glass when you see them? This guy, this loud guy back here, that's well, I mean, probably Arcane would be one, at least philosophically. That's very flattering. I think Raph and I would beam with delight if, if you know, thinking about that. That's, that's certainly our goal. Um, irrational certainly is, is one of those. I would say Arcane. Yeah, yeah I would really. say you guys. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and uh, Junction Point. Um, I mean, I'm unemployed, but uh, I get to visit studios a lot. Uh, uh, so yeah, Arcane, Junction Point. And I would throw a rational into that. 
All right, is that it? Is that all we have time for? All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming and listening, and give a round of applause to our panelists here. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.